during the session, please submit your questions and comments. We want to hear from you. I will share them with our moderator and she will adjust them at the end following the panel discussion. I'd like to thank the organizers of today's session, including SSP volunteer, Mike DiNatale from AAAS and our moderator, Angela Cochran. I would also like to thank our panelists from the Scholarly Kitchen. And last but not least, I am grateful to the Charleston Conference team and especially Leah Hines and Beth Bernhardt for working so hard to make a virtual meeting possible for us. Thank you. Uh, just a little bit of information about SSP before we start. SSP is a membership organization that is focused on connecting professionals in our industry to people, information, and professional development resources you need to uh, succeed in scholarly communications. We offer a variety of news, information, and resources, not only the Scholarly Kitchen, but also our weekly e-news e digest. Remember, the SSP member exchange and access to the journal Learned Publishing. Most recently, we launched our Quick Connect program. This is a micro-mentoring program in connecting knowledge seekers who need guidance on a particular issue or question with trusted advisors. If you are interested in learning more about Quick Connect or about becoming an SSP member, I encourage you to visit our website at sspnet.org. The theme of our discussion today is getting back to business. To kick it off, it is my pleasure to introduce Angela Cochran, Vice President of Publishing at the American Society of Clinical Oncology, past president of both SSP and the Council of Science Editors and associate editor at the Scholarly Kitchen. Angela. Thanks, Mary Beth. And thank you all for joining us today. So way back in the first quarter of the year, as different parts of the world were shutting down in the face of the global COVID-19 pandemic, businesses and institutions were preparing for a three to six month interruption of activities with the hope that economic recovery would start probably by the end of the year. But today a new reality has become apparent and for many organizations, financial recovery is now looking like 12 to 24 months away. How we live, how we learn, how we communicate with each other has certainly changed um, over the past several months. And further, the economic impact of the pandemic has become acute. Universities have been hard hit with in-person classes and commun communal living being difficult. Library budgets have been slashed in some places and so societies that depend on both annual meeting and publication revenue are experiencing a double hit to the bottom line, all while submissions continue to increase by double digit percentages. Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about when and how we'll get back to our core functions, what might go back to pre-COVID days and what we've learned that we might wanna keep and what we have an opportunity to change. But before I start, uh, I'd like to ask each of our chefs to introduce themselves. So why don't we start with you, Alice? Thanks, Angela. Hi, everyone. I'm Alice Meadows. I'm the Director of Community Engagement at NISO, which is the National Information Standards Organization. And I am President-elect of SSP and a chef. Thank you. Rick? I'm Rick Anderson. I am a university librarian at Brigham Young University. Joe? Hi, I'm Joe Esposito. I'm senior partner with Clark and Esposito, a consulting firm. And Robert. Hi, um, I'm Robert, Robert Harrington. I am associate executive director of the American Mathematical Society, essentially in charge of the publishing stuff that we do. <laughs> All those bits and stuffs. <laughs> Yeah. So, Alice, I want to start with you. Um, I said a pretty doom and gloom intro to our economic crisis, um, but do you think that we can ensure continued funding and sustainability for the not-for-profit re research infrastructure that so many researcher tools and services rely on? Well, I think... I hope it's not complete doom and gloom, but I think, um, you know, we all have cause to be concerned about our revenues over the next year or two, for sure. I think this year we've all been somewhat insulated from the effects because for many of us, um, you know, we work on a calendar year basis. And so we had collected a lot of our expected revenues for the year before um, before the uh, COVID really hit financially but I think for next year and possibly for the year after we may be looking at a different scenario and it's hard for everyone it's hard for 
the universities that we work with who are you know have, have lower student numbers and less revenue it's hard for the publishers that serve those universities and libraries and it's hard for organizations like mine in the research infrastructure that rely on funding from our members who are primarily university libraries publishers um, and some vendor organizations and again the vendors are also affected um, so I think it is very concerning and I think there are a lot of um, open research infrastructure organizations that are primarily funded through membership which historically has been a very um, sustainable and appropriate method of funding because it's very um, consensus driven it's good for governance um, and it has meant on the whole you know a, a, a more risk-free approach um, Funding from funders is obviously another source of income for many open research infrastructure organisations. And right now, that's probably quite a good place to be because arguably the funders are not in such a difficult situation because um, despite all the uh, financial difficulties that COVID has brought, um, actually the stock market is doing, still proving pretty resilient. And so um, for, for organisations that are more dependent on that, I think they are in a less difficult place. But I really hope that people will, that, 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 that the organisations, whether it's a funder or university or a publisher or a vendor, who have historically supported organisations like NISO and ORCID and Crossref and the other sort of elements of the research, open research infrastructure, will really think twice before they discontinue that support because the work that we do enables the researchers who ultimately all of us support to do the work they do and to do it efficiently and well and with um, you know, a minimum of uh, burden. It gives them the tools and services that they need to be able to work productively and efficiently and effectively and to create research and science that's reproducible and in many cases openly available. So that was a bit of a rambling answer, but I think the answer is it, it is somewhat doom and gloom, but I believe that if we all keep our eye on, the, on our collective shared goal of supporting researchers, then I hope people will continue to put what money they can uh, where they can where they can support all elements of, of um, research, including the infrastructure. You're on mute, Angela. Thank you. Um, thinking about sort of the you know the the funds that are available to to kind of keep things keep things moving. I'm curious, Joe, if you see any new opportunities for scholarly publishers given this situation we find ourselves in? Well, the answer to that is uh, yes. Uh, there are always are opportunities. Uh, and in a time of disruption, the op number of opportunities actually grows because a lot of incumbents will find their own operations hampered in some way, or they may not have a management team that understands how to take advantage of opportunities. Growth takes place in times of change, not in times of stability. And by growth, I mean not incremental growth, but rapid and significant growth. I think the first thing to be said, though, about this is that uh, this, the, the opportunities are not on the level of the community as a whole. Opportunities are on the level of individual organizations. And the reason for that is because the situation is highly competitive. Uh, so you can't have everybody winning. Uh, you know, not, not everybody's uh, child can be above average. Uh, some people will outstrip others in their uh, achievements. And therefore, talking about opportunities or strategies in a broad way for an entire community is really misplaced. The question is what an individual organization can do going forward. I would say there are some areas that are probably uh, less ripe for uh, growth. Uh, I think that the, uh, the publishers who have been historically in the business of selling content to libraries are going to find that to be a very, very difficult market. Uh, I don't see any prospect of enlarged funding in the academic library sector over the next few years. And that tends to suggest that established players in that market uh, are likely to do better than others. So this is probably an, uh, an instance of where the big will get bigger and everybody else is going to um, uh, uh, suffer or find some accommodation with those larger publishers. But I think that the real opportunity now is to coming up with new content forms. Uh, and um, I am myself personally uh, studying very seriously the newsletter market. Uh, the newsletter market is intriguing to me, not only because of the advent of very significant, robust platforms uh, for them, 
uh, we all know of, of, of Substack, for, for example, where mm -hmm. this community's friend, Kent Anderson, uh, has a very, very popular uh, subscription service. But I subscribe to several Substack uh, newsletters now. Uh, our own company works on MailChimp. There are others out there. So the presence of these platforms is making newsletter publishing more feasible from a technical point of view. But newsletters also have uh, a lot of uh, merits. Uh, what they do is instead of uh, publishing primary research, they serve as a discovery tool. Uh, they cut through the noise. And there's, of course, a lot of noise in scholarly publishing today because of the sheer quantity of material that's out there. But I add to that, that open access increases the noise because it uh, tends to generate more publishing. So the greater the amount of open access publishing we have, the greater the opportunity for newsletters to cut through that material. And uh, the final point I'd make, and, you know, and this is a topic where one can go on endlessly for sure, but the final point I'd make is that with this uh, astonishing growth in the output of scholarly and scientific materials, uh, it does seem to me that increasingly this material is going to be ingested not by human beings, but by machines. Uh, and publishers uh, who see an opportunity to create materials whose primary use is by machines are going to be in an advantageous uh, uh, position. I, I think we're entering a period now, and I, I don't think this is a science fiction scenario. This is this is like, you know, this is the opportunity next door. Uh, we, are, we start to create material for machines that process this material for other machines, and that increasingly the output of scientific publishers is going to be uh, with that machine basis in mind. Now, just what that's going to mean technically, what kind of material that is, I do not know. But certainly, if I were running a publishing organization today, the opportunities I would be seeking would not be in trying to find the highest rank, ranked article uh, by an individual to be read by other individuals, but I'd be looking at um, mass production of machine readable texts that can be ingested by machines for new machine based discoveries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, Robert, I mentioned in the intro that societies in particular are really going to have a, a tough time in the next 12 to 24 months. We uh, depend on people coming to our in-person conference as, as one major source of revenue. Um, we're expecting lower revenue on our publication sales. And for some members um, and some organizations, that is the membership. You know, the, the having the annual meeting and um, is, is a big part of it. And so even membership could stay flat going forward. And now um, we won't have machines showing up as, as Joe was saying, if our, if machines become our customers, they don't go to our annual conference. So what do, um, how can societies position their publishing operations for 2021? And what might it look like when we emerge on the other side? Well, yeah, I mean, like everybody else, societies, uh, not sure what the future is going to hold. Um, I mean, we're an, a membership organization, um, and there are many societies like ours that have significant memberships. And from our governance point of view, that membership is the priority. Um, though, you know, it's not a new dynamic in the sense that we actually, a lot of what we do programmatically is for the whole of the community, or the whole of the math community in our case. And actually, you can sometimes argue that the benefits we provide to members, <laughs> you know, we should probably do more on that front and less for the whole community, or maybe not. But whatever we do, um, and, you know, examples of that kind of thing, are you can have a look at our open math notes, for example, which is a bit like the archive for books, for works in progress, lecture notes, and it's an open resource. A lot of these sorts of initiatives are essentially reliant upon the revenues and the revenues for the AMS, 70% of them are from our publication. It's around 23 million or so. So, you know, the, for this, and the interesting piece of what's been happening is that for 2020, again, like most, we have recognized most of our revenues in the early part of the year. So you can kind of continue on and sort of say, well, things are looking okay for 2020, um, which is certainly true. So, the, so what do you do going forward to make sure that you're positioning yourself or at least recognize that you have to do some things to position yourself for an uncertain future? What we have been doing, and I suspect others are too, is looking very carefully at, at, at our workflows and our, we do everything in house. So, you know, we've actually 
this has been a silver lining in a way. We've been forced into really examining how efficient we are. Mm -hmm. um, looking at our, so trimming costs. We're doing things like only publishing in hardcover, uh, sorry, only publishing in softcover our books temporarily. Um, and that, but that with a few exceptions, depending on, on what books we're talking about. But, you know, the things that, that may fundamentally change the way we're looking at, at publishing, whether we're publishing more for online teaching uh, in terms of books or in terms of uh, our journals, how, how can we have a paperless workflow now that we're all remote working, which is a remarkable achievement in itself, um, having a paperless workflow where we're not actually printing out every email that we, that we write, um, you know, has changed the way we work. And that's something that will stick. Um, so, I mean, having said all of that, uh, we've also had things like voluntary separation packages where we've just had to make sure that, you know, we, we understand that our budgets are not going to be what they were. Um, but at least we're thinking ahead. And that's the thing. We're not sticking our head in the sand. And I'm hoping that many societies uh, are doing that. When it comes to uh, the community, we know our communities are suffering. There was a really good study from Elsevier recently of over 2,000 journals that, that basically said that while article, articles are being, uh, article submissions are up, it's, the, it's women who are really suffering disproportionately uh, in terms of their output during this time of the, of the pandemic. And we have to understand that these kinds of, of, of issues are important, certainly for us. And I think from certainly there was a, in my last post on the kitchen, uh, I presented some data from McKinley Associates. And what was one of the interesting things from that data was that many societies, including ours, are still prioritizing amidst the pandemic diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Mm -hmm. That's encouraging, um, but it, more work is going to need to be done. Um, as far as meetings go, again, like everybody else, we're confused. Um, it's not so much the sessions themselves that we're worried about. Mm -hmm. It's the, you know, an overly zoomed out group of attendees. Are they really going to do anything other than go to the sessions? Are they going to come to our exhibits, visit the membership booths? Many of our, 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 our professors, our mathematicians, are trying to balance teaching commitments in the midst of trying to attend conferences. You know, these are things you wouldn't do if you're actually physically present at a conference. So we haven't got the answers to that yet, but we were clearly like others are trying to innovate and incentivize, you know, people to come to the booths, whether it be through raffles or whatever it may be, because we, mm -hmm. we want to try and sort of at least and preserve that aspect of what it means to be at a conference. I've got plenty more I can say, but I think I'm waffling at this point. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, there's a secret sauce that will emerge, I'm, I'm convinced at some point to make virtual meetings as um, fulfilling and enjoyable as, as in-person, but I don't think we've quite found it yet. Um, Rick, there's really no question that universities are in a, a very precarious position right now. Uh, schools from kindergarten through large universities were forced to start one way uh, this year with hopes that, you know, maybe by the second half of the year, they would return to something that looked a little bit more normal. Starting to look like that might not happen. So what happens now that students and faculty are realizing that we may have another whole semester like this? Yeah, so that, that's actually a really interesting question because there, there uh, have been, um, so, so one of the really surprising things this fall has been how limited the impact of COVID has been on university enrollment generally in the United States. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, so, so one estimate that I've seen uh, indicated that the impact on enrollment was really a reduction of only around 2% nationally. The problem is that 2% hides some very important, uh, some, some very important subgroups. So for example, um, the impact on community colleges has been significantly greater. Um, Well-to-do white students have been much more likely to say, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and go to university this fall than uh, poorer students of color who have been much more significantly impacted in their, in their educational plans. Um, so those are, those are important caveats to that, to that relatively small number. Another one that has a more direct bearing on uh, universities themselves 
is the fact that in that 2% uh, enrollment drop are hidden lots and lots of international students who, especially if you're a public university, are responsible for a disproportionate amount of your tuition revenue because of course they pay out of state tuition um, and often come with uh, subsidies from their governments. Uh, I mean, for, for living, uh, living costs and stuff like that. So, um, you know, the, the, the impact of one fewer international student uh, versus the impact of one fewer in-state student is, is very, very different. Um, so universities are in general, in general doing okay. Some universities are really, really struggling. What's going to be interesting uh, after the holiday break is going, is going to be seeing to what degree students experience on campus in a COVID scenario, uh, what impact that has on their decision to come back to school. Now, I was anticipating this spring that lots and lots of students would say, you know what, maybe this fall isn't the time for me to start my college mm -hmm. career. Maybe I'll take a gap year, find a job, earn some money, plan to start college next year. And many people were anticipating that that was gonna happen in significant numbers. And in fact, there were some uh, predictions that enrollment at universities uh, could fall anywhere from 10 to 20%. Um, I was surprised to see that not happen. So I am more inclined to think that uh, enrollments in the uh, winter or spring, whatever your institution calls it, um, enrollments in the, the next semester are probably going to stay relatively stable. Um, if next fall we're still operating under COVID restrictions, I think that's when um, the experience that students had this year is, is likely to have more of an impact on their decision making. If in fact COVID is still significantly impacting uh, university practices next fall, I think one thing that we will see is a significant spectrum of difference from institution to institution. There will be some institutions that are much more strict and some that are less strict uh, because at that point we'll be in a very different point in the, co in the, in the pandemic uh, timeline. And I think that the differential of policies on campus is going to affect enrollment probably more than uh, COVID itself has affected enrollment. Mm. In libraries, in libraries, we're seeing a very, very different experiences from university to university, and different. Uh, you know, for example, at the University of Utah, where I was for the last thirteen years, um, patrons are still not able to go into the book stacks on their own. If they want a book from the stacks, they have to request it, and a member of staff goes and gets it and brings it out. At Brigham Young University, the library has never closed, and the stacks continue to be open. Um, there's just there's already so much so much variation from library to library within the university system that that that's going to be uh, fodder for some very interesting articles in the future. <laughs> for sure, and just how or some very very uh, boring articles actually interesting <laughs> to me. No, I I think um, you know just sort of rethinking uh, higher education in general and and what we're learning about online learning. Um, delivery of content, um, you know, with the Frankfurt sessions, we talked about eBooks and how difficult eBooks have been for libraries to um, to purchase, uh, you know, in in to supplement their uh, physical collections during this time. <clears throat> so there are definitely things that we can do, <coughs> excuse me, better in the future that we've learned our, our shortfalls uh, because of the pandemic. Alice, you're in a you're in a really great position being at NISO of you know kind of sitting in the middle of um, different kinds of you know publishers and and startups and funders and and other community initiatives. Are you finding that the pandemic is encouraging more collaboration or is it more uh, pushing towards more competition? Um, I think from NISO's perspective, the I mean, NISO, as you say, is very much a consensus driven organisation. We're all about bringing the different stakeholders to the table and trying to um, find solutions for shared problems that maybe not everybody absolutely loves, but everybody can accept and work with. Um, and I think we have found this year that 
uh, that that hasn't changed. The thing that has changed a little bit is that some of the work is taking longer because people have so many other pressures on their time as a result of the pandemic. So, you know, whether it's childcare or, um, you know, other, other forms of care or whatever it might be, pressures at work. Um, so some of our work is taking longer than it would normally do to actually come through to fruition. But I would say there's been no, um, no, uh, shifting in terms of the desire to collaborate which I think is really important I think the opportunity to collaborate is actually greater and more important at times like this you don't want people to be sort of in their own silos trying to fix problems on their own when you can come up with a shared solution that will hopefully take less time be, be better for the whole community um, and enable the the opportunity to work together which again I think just as humans it's really important for us to feel to focus on what we have in common and what what we can do collectively rather than just focusing on our own sometimes individual misery um, and and uh, constraints so I would say um, yeah collaboration's always super important more so than ever and so far at NISO and I think this is true of the other research infrastructure organizations I'm either involved with or, or um, have contacts at that, that there really hasn't been any letting off of that desire to uh, to find common ways through these challenges and I think that's really a hopeful thing. Yeah yeah um, I want to remind everyone who's who's watching that uh, you know we will have some time at the end for your questions uh, for the chefs as well. So please um, feel free to put those into the the chat in Pathable, and and those will get forwarded on to us. Um, but I have I have a few more questions. Um, you know, Robert, societies, professional organizations have talked forever about becoming more digital organizations, mostly as our membership has expanded globally. Um, and we look for ways for uh, encouraging new audiences to participate. But how much work do you think really lies ahead for societies to get to that? I mean, this feels like a violent shove in that direction. Yeah, I mean, I sort of alluded to this a little bit earlier that we're, you know, on the one hand, in terms of workflows, we're really moving to a more digital environment. As far as our communities are concerned, I think each discipline, each society that represents these, their discipline has to understand what the needs of their constituents are. Um, we are certain, I mean, one, one interesting example of how we are trying to address opportunity in the digital environment, for example, is to say, well, those who are teaching online, um, most, most are now being asked to teach online many through the, the next, the whole of the rest of this particular academic year, if not beyond. And they're also being asked to teach online using only accessible content. Um, mm. So what does that mean, both for our, uh, our publishing authors, for books and journals, but also for those teaching? So what we're, in math, of course, there's an extra layer of complexity about just you know math content being displayed online so what we're doing is we've actually we're actually holding webinars for our, our community and also for our authors and editors and librarians in our in our area and we're going to be basically talking and teaching and educating about ex how to be accessible in an online teaching environment or an online publishing environment for math content so you know, that actually, there's a there's some business opportunity there because um, we will charge for some, but for others who are uh, authors or members, we probably won't. And, you know, so basically what we're trying to do there is embrace um, a need through a digital opportunity. Whether or not that's going to change the way that we publish our books and journals, I don't know. I do think we are going to need to understand how best to publish books especially those for teaching in an online mm -hmm. environment um though of course in math there's still a huge desire anachronistically for for print as well and so that that's just a quick example of, of how we're thinking digitally and i assume other fields will be embracing similar sorts of ideas yeah rick i want to ask you a follow-up to to what robert was saying um it it seems that uh with the shift to um, online teaching um, at the universities and this um, preference for, you know, either already owned or accessible um, uh, information that, that, you know, course packets and, and readings and materials, 
I, I'm curious how the librarian support of faculty, you know, kind of the day-to-day -day support that librarians have, um, offer for faculty has changed um, when it comes to either procuring those resources or pointing faculty and students to accessible resources. And, and does it sort of change the role of, of a traditional collections manager? I, I haven't seen a significant shift uh, at my institution. Now, uh, the, the, the problem I've got in trying to answer your question is that I've been at my current institution for two months and I left my <laughs> previous institution before the school year began. So, <laughs> um, so in the current, in the, I, I, I'm not really well positioned to answer, mm -hmm. uh, to answer as, as far as the impact of COVID on, on that right now. Okay. Um, Joe, you always like to give us a, a big picture view of, you know, kind of who the, who the winners and losers are of pretty much any um, scenario. So my big question for you is who are the big winners coming out of the pandemic? Well, uh, putting Zoom aside uh, as, as a big winner, um, I think that when one looks at the budgetary situation in academic publishing right now, uh, I think we're going to be experiencing more consolidation uh, in difficult markets. Uh, there's a tendency for uh, the economy to consolidate around fewer and fewer nodes on the network. Uh, so I don't know if, if Elsevier will be a, a big winner, but it will certainly be the most conspicuous winner consolidating its position going forward, at least in the traditional aspect of the business. Uh, a very interesting thing uh, for me is to watch the competition between Wiley and Springer Nature. Mm. Uh, they're, the two of them are pursuing strategies that are in many ways uh, very, very similar. Uh, they have uh, swallowed wholesale the notion that they have to be doing transformative agreements and they're moving to high volume uh, open access publishing and moving away from high prestige publishing uh, in their primary uh, uh, focus. Now, the question here is, I think, not whether or not high volume uh, open access publishing uh, is going to be important or not. The question is, will there be more than one winner? Uh, because in a networked environment, it's a guerrilla game. Uh, one entity tends to take everything. You know, there is mm. one Facebook, there is one Amazon, uh, there is one Google. And that's not simply because uh, people are nasty and mean, although people are, of course, nasty and mean, but it's because the structure of the economy lends itself to uh, consolidation and dominance in a networked environment. So I think that the interesting thing to watch going forward is that Wiley Springer Nature com uh, competition, because I really don't think that the two of them are going to be able to uh, exist side by side in a semi equivalency that they experience today. Interesting. Um, I, I think you're probably right. And um, as you mentioned with Elsevier's sort of shift in focus to data and um, analytics, uh, they have um, kind of secured themselves a spot that, that is unique um, and probably fairly well protected in, in an environment like this. Rick, you and I had been talking at one point about a, a, a article in the Chronicle about you know kind of the lagging indicators with with the pandemic that maybe we're not we're not really seeing the full economic brunt um, right away that it might take some time and that uh, there's some I think we're all struggling with forecasting uh, you know when when the financial recovery will be and what that will look like how how difficult is it to kind of do that? Uh, future scenario planning um, for you know a large library like yours in this environment. Uh, you know it it varies so much from institution to institution. Um, at at my institution, we're we uh, have been told um, basically not to ask for any more money for next year, but uh, we are also expecting that uh, people's salaries will uh, increase at a normal rate. I know of other institutions where um, uh, where, where where libraries are having to plan for multiple budget cut scenarios and where um, they're implementing uh, progressive salary cuts. Um, it just the situation seems to be all over the place. Honestly, I think I think one of the most troubling uh, 
I mean, when we talk about lagging indicators of economic impact, I think perhaps the most troubling thing for the economic future of universities right now is the impact on athletics, mm. um, where you know you can't you can't sell sixty thousand tickets to a football game uh, every week throughout the fall semester. Um, that's going to have an impact on your on your university's revenues in the in the coming year. Um, I, I don't know to what degree we can expect that impact to trickle down to academic programs, but uh, it can't possibly help. Um, yeah. I, I think another thing that we need to think about is the differential impact that we're seeing on different types of institutions. I mentioned that enrollments generally have not been hit as hard as we expected them to be. That's true at universities. Interestingly, it's much less true at community colleges, which have been hit much harder, which is not what I would have anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I just think that this is such a, I mean, we, you know, everybody, we, we laugh about how every, how we keep saying unprecedented, 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 but the reality is we don't have a great template for predicting what's going to happen. Um, this really is the type of thing that hasn't happened in anybody's current lifetime. And uh, we're, ju we're just doing our best to prepare for scenarios as best we can. Yeah. I have to just jump in really quickly and say your comment about the academics, Rick, is very much a US comment. I'm not sure that's yes. applicable in yes. any other part of the world. Yeah, um, thank, thank you, Alice. You're absolutely right. I'm, I'm very much I mean, speaking it's, from a It's not from insignificant a here, obviously, but it's, right. it's, it's just funny with my sort of British hat on. I'm like, well, yeah. yeah, I suppose that yeah, does no. make sense. Co but... college, college football is an issue in the US that it is not elsewhere. <laughs> Uh, we do have a, a question that's come in from um, from our viewers today. So pre-COVID, some 70% of library budgets were being spent on big deals. Um, does the panel think that these will break down and lead to the University of California rejections and similar alternatives? I, I, I think we need to correct a, a data uh, misconception there. It, I, I think what this questioner meant to say was 70% of library materials budgets. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's interesting from, I've been wondering from a society perspective, um, even before the pandemic hit about how we're gonna think about transformative deals, big deals, what's, what's gonna happen as the pandemic hit, it does sort of, it does sort of beg the question of how larger institutions can keep supporting smaller institutions, which is sort of the model I see in transformative arrangements. I don't think that's sustainable. And to some extent at the AMS, for example, we're looking potentially to a, a brighter future, I think, if we can say that the big deals might to some extent break down and essential content, and often we would like to think at least that our society content is defined as essential affordable content, will actually have more of a chance of gaining some share within, within library budgets. Maybe I'm dreaming, but I would, I would you know, I like to dream um, and <laughs> hopefully my dreams will all come true. I think that the issue about the big deal in part is the unstated issue of what it means to operate at industrial scale uh, the cost per article in some of these large applications is a fraction of the cost per article when libraries purchase individual journals or work with society publishers. Uh, I wish it were otherwise, uh, but I think that when we, people begin to examine what it means to break up their aggregations, I, I don't particularly like the phrase, the big deal, but large collections, uh, what they're going to see is that they'll be uh, paying a lot more uh, not only in terms of the value of the content, but also in the administrative costs of having to manage uh, so many um, subscriptions across so many publishers. Uh, what is always lost in this discussion of uh, the big deal aggregations and so forth is that these were things that were welcomed by the library community because of the administrative efficiencies that they provided. And those efficiencies do not suddenly uh, uh, reassert themselves if these aggregations get broken up. So I think that we're going to see the, the big deal very much part of our lives in the future. It may be in an altered form, may not have quite the same amount of market share it does today, but I don't really see that we have a revolution in scholarly publishing going on. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the administrative part of it is important as, um, you know, I think even in our own organizations, making a big, making big changes, um, 
for the sake of making them <laughs> sort of feels like not the right time to do that, that, you know, things are just a little bit too precarious to, um, you know, you really have to prioritize, prioritize the moves and perhaps taking on a much more administratively burdensome approach to um, procuring materials is, is going to wait a little longer. Um, you know, there's been loads of uh, questions about what this pandemic means for open access going forward. Um, you know, the, boy, it's, it's, we see the value of getting information out quickly so that researchers can, can access the content that they need in a, in a speedy fashion. Um, but at the same time, we have um, the financial pressures and whether or not, um, you know, there will be enough money in the system as has been purported over the years. There's enough money in the system to move over to, uh, to switch everything to open access. Do well, we and, think and that Angela, at the end of this? Well, and Angela, we also, we've also seen the danger of getting science out very quickly. Right. Where we've seen, where we've seen people deliberately putting crappy science out onto preprint servers because they can get it there and then promoting this crappy science as well. This is as published in the, you know, whatever, Med Archive or, uh, not to pick on Medarchive, but it could be any. It could be any place. So, it, it, getting science out quickly is is something that comes with tremendous benefits and also tremendous risks, and we're seeing both of those. Yes. So, do we think that there is going to still be enough money in the system to money in the system to uh, to really affect a, um, a significant flip to open access? You know, it's fascinating, isn't it? I, I, I would say it's sort of a bit like your point about wholesale change being a difficult thing to grasp in the midst of, of a crisis. I, I don't think it's going to happen in a rush. I, I, don't, I personally don't see that transformative agreements are sustainable. Um, that's a controversial opinion. I accept that. Um, but I don't think given what the pandemic is going to do to us in the long term, that transformative arrangements are going to be sustainable. So what does that mean for open access? It's a good question. I know in our case, we're very happy that we've launched a diamond open access journal. Or we're launching it for next year because we're not burdening our community in any way, whether mm -hmm. it be libraries or authors. Um, we are lucky to have a donor that will, will fund that, uh, a major new ent entity, but it's the right thing for our community at, at this particular time. That not everyone can do it that way, of course. Mm -hmm. I don't subscribe to the money in the system argument. I think that's economically naive. The money in the system is a function of the ecosystem that exists. It's a function of the millions and millions of small decisions that people are making every moment as they allocate capital for investments, for purchases and everything else. Uh, if one were to try to make the flip that people are talking about, the amount of money will change because the economic system that undergirds it is going to change as well. So I really, I, I think that it's, it's uh, naive to believe that um, uh, the, the economy is independent of the structure of the, under, uh, of the economy underneath it. Uh, it's just not going to, it's not going to happen that way. It does mean other things aren't going to happen, but it's not going to be because you can do a flip with the same amount of dollars. Mm -hmm. And I kind of agree with you, Joe, although for completely different reasons, I'm not coming at this from an economic um, aspect, but I think it's just really interesting that one of the things that has been signaled clearly um, through the pandemic is, you know, the number of publishers that made their materials openly available was really an acknowledgement that that, that that does help, that that does speed up science, that that is useful to the to the community now, how that's going to get paid for, whether there's going to, whether that's going to, well, it's clearly not going to continue for now but I think that that um it has it's I believe it has made a bit of a change in the mindset of a number of people which may further down the line result in um open access being more mm -hmm. widespread than it is now and that will be our last word for today I want to thank our panelists for joining me in this discussion and thank the Charleston conference for um for having us again um, I also want to um, mention that we have a Scholarly Kitchen webinar coming up in November, the future of research funding that we invite you to participate in. Thank you all for attending today and enjoy the rest of the conference. Be safe.